7. Seward When the Lincoln administration suddenly found itself faced with open hostilities and accompanying espionage and spy intrigues in 1861, one of the first officials to react to the situation was Secretary of State Seward. His organization combined both the police function, pursuing individuals with a view to their incarceration and prosecution, and the intelligence function, gathering information regarding the loyalty and political views of citizens without any particular regard for possible violations of the law. In combining the two tasks, of course, their distinction often became lost. One commentator notes, quote, The government's first efforts to control the civilian population were conducted by the Secretary of State for reasons both personal and official. William H. Seward, the premier of the cabinet, had an unquenchable zeal for dabbling in everyone else's business. In addition, since the establishment of the federal government, the office of the Secretary of State had been somewhat of a catch-all for duties no other executive agency was designed to handle. With the war and the new problem of subversion on the home front, Seward soon began to busy himself about arrests of political prisoners, their incarceration, and then the next step of setting up secret agents to ferret them out. End quote. Footnote. George Fort Milton, Abraham Lincoln and the Fifth Column, New York, The Vanguard Press, 1942, page 48. End footnote. There are no informative records as to how or why the initial arrests of political prisoners and the creation of a secret service fell to Secretary Seward. It is entirely likely that he requested these duties. The more important consideration, however, concerns the extent to which he responsibly carried out these obligations. According to one of the Secretary's biographers, quote, "...arrests were made for any one of many reasons." where men were suspected of having given or intending to give aid or comfort to the enemy in any substantial way, as by helping in the organization of troops, by supplying arms or provisions, or selling the bonds of the states in secession by public or private communications that opposed United States enlistments or encouraged those of the Confederacy, by expressing sympathy with the South or attacking the administration, by belonging to organizations designed to obstruct the progress of the war, in fact, for almost any act that indicated a desire to see the government fail in its effort to conquer disunion. End quote. Footnote. Frederick Bancroft, The Life of William H. Seward, Volume 2. New York, Harper and Brothers, 1900, page 260. End footnote. But the question was not simply one of fact. A number of due process considerations were raised by the manner and nature of the arrest and detention of political offenders. Quote, the person suspected of disloyalty was often seized at night, searched, borne off to the nearest fort, deprived of his valuables, and locked up in a casemate or in a battery generally crowded with men that had had similar experiences. It was not rare for arrests regarded as political to be made by order of the Secretary of War or of some military officer. But with only a few exceptions, these prisoners came under the control of the Secretary of State, just as if he had taken the original action. For a few days, the newcomer usually varied reflection and loud denunciation of the administration. But the discomforts of his confinement soon led him to seek his freedom. When he resolved to send for friends and an attorney, he was informed that the rules forbade visitors, except in rare instances, that attorneys were entirely excluded, and the prisoner who sought their aid would greatly prejudice his case. Only unsealed letters would be forwarded, and if they contained objectionable statements, they were returned to the writer or filed in the Department of State with other papers relating to the case. There still remained a possibility, it was generally assumed, of speedy relief by appeal to the secretary in person. Then a long narrative describing the experiences of a man whose innocence was equaled only by his misfortunes was addressed to the nervous, wiry, all-powerful man keeping watch over international relations, political offenders, and affairs generally. The letter was usually read by the chief clerk or assistant secretary 
and then merely filed. A second, third, and fourth petition for liberation and explanations was sent to the department, but with no result save that the materials for the study of history and human nature were thereby enlarged. The secretary was calm in the belief that the man was a plotter and could do no harm while he remained in custody. End quote. To rectify this situation, two important steps were taken in February 1862. On St. Valentine's Day, an executive order was issued providing for the wholesale release of most political prisoners, excepting only, quote, persons detained as spies in the service of the insurgents or others whose release at the present moment may be deemed incompatible with the public safety, end quote. In addition, a special review panel, consisting of Judge Edwards Pierpont and General John A. Dix, was established to expedite releases under this directive. Footnote. The correspondence of this panel and lists of those released at its direction may be found in Fred C. Ainsworth and Joseph W. Kirkley Comps, The War of the Rebellion, a compilation of the official records of the Union and Confederate Armies, Series 2, Volume 2, Washington, U.S. Government Print Office, 1897. End footnote. With regard to intelligence activities, Seward apparently employed Alan Pinkerton for such operations during the summer of 1861, quote, but did not keep him long, perhaps because he felt that the detective was too close to the president, and Seward wanted his own man, whose loyalty would be direct to him, end quote. A listening post was sought in Canada for purposes of checking on the activities of Confederate agents and to monitor the trend of sentiment in British North America during the secession crisis. Footnote. See John W. Headley, Confederate Operations in Canada and New York. New York and Washington, The Neal Publishing Company, 1906. Also of related interest is James D. Bullock, The Secret Service of the Confederate States in Europe. New York, Thomas Yosiloff, 1956. Originally published 1884. End footnote. Former Massachusetts Congressman George Ashman was appointed special agent to Canada for three months in early 1861 at a salary of $10 a day plus expenses. Seward advanced $500 cash on account. Another operative, Charles S. Ogden, took residence in Quebec, and additional stations were subsequently established at Halifax and St. John's, among other seaports. A domestic network also came into being while the Canadian group struggled to recruit confidential agents. Quote, Seward's Secret Service Letter Book for 1861 was full of inquiries dispatched to friends and trusted official associates throughout the country, asking them to discover persons who could be put on important investigating tasks. He wanted a discreet and active man for the northern frontier, to arrest spies seeking entrance from Canada, and offered to pay such a man $100 a month. A little later, he appointed a special agent at Niagara Falls to examine the persons coming over the suspension bridge and seize and hold any who seemed suspicious. He sought, without immediate results, a good man for Chicago and another for Detroit. He authorized the United States Marshal at Boston to employ two detectives for two months' time, each at $150 a month. This was particularly urgent. Therefore, let the marshal consult the governor of the state and take effective measures to break up the business of making and sending shoes for the rebel army. End quote. Almost unnoticed, Seward's intelligence organization began to grow, though its agents often proved to be ineffective amateurs. Shortly, however, professionalism, discipline, and a careful sense of mission came to the Secretary's spy corps in the purpose of Lafayette Charles Baker. This is Our Hidden History.